Welcome to What the Paper Said, in which I, Patrick Crozier, skim through the times from 100 years ago, read some of the articles and comment on the ones I found interesting. In this episode, the week ending the 29th of April 1923, who will take responsibility for the BBC? What hyperinflation is like? And Mr Stambuliski does well in the Bulgarian elections. Perhaps a bit too well. But first, the headlines. The Ruhr conflict, the occupation of the Ruhr, continues. Um, there's been more clashes between French, the French army and uh, German workers. There's some conversation about talks, or well, conversation about talks about talks, that would be, um, but very much out, very little else to, to report. The uh, Norfolk farm strike has ended. In the Irish Civil War, uh, three rebels were executed, and then the rebels announced they were going on ceasefire. In the House of Commons, the Health Minister, one Neville Chamberlain, has introduced a housing bill which will allow the government to subsidise uh, the building of houses, but only of a certain size. The royal wedding between the Duke of York and Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon has taken place amidst much pomp and circumstance. And, uh, well, the Times even uh, thought fit to print a four-page supplement. Uh, there have also been commemorations for Shakespeare's, or the 300th anniversary of Shakespeare's death, and Liverpool have won the league title, or more accurately, they have retained the league title. That's in soccer, in case you weren't aware. In other news, there has been, have been commemorations for the 5th anniversary of the Zeebrugge raid. Now, if you're unaware of this, this uh, took place in April 1918, and was a raid on uh, by the Royal Navy on the German base at on the Belgian coast on that Zeebrugge on the Belgian coast. Now the aim was to sink some block ships in the harbour, and by doing so, block the the base to German U-boats. Now. As it happened, they did sink three ships, but not in quite the right place, which meant that the Germans were able to reuse the base very soon afterwards. They also lost a lot of men. It was something like 400 deaths in the course of one, one night. That apparent disaster does not, has not prevented the Times from saying what a great raid it was. Uh, which I suppose is an illustration of how uh, reality and the narrative often are at a variance. Uh, also talking about the Great War, there was a report about the work of the Royal Ordnance, who uh, printed maps during the war. Um, competition time, guess how many maps they printed. Uh, if you got anywhere near 32 million, I have to say, well done. There's also been some fighting in Munich. Uh, I think you can guess between whom. Oh, maybe you can't. It's the National Socialists against the International Socialists. Uh, 400 people involved, one person shot. Uh, I'm not quite sure that's good going or bad going. Who knows? In Britain, we do faction fighting slightly differently. We go to court. Uh, this is a this is a case uh, which was to do with the general election and, and uh, concerned the... Uh, South End on, or the battle in South End on Sea. Uh, it involved the defeat, defeated Liberal candidate uh, suing the chairman of the local Conservative Association for libel. Uh, the jury found for the plaintiff and awarded him a grand total of one farthing in damages. If you're not aware of what a farthing is, uh, it is one quarter of an old penny. Okay, so a penny is worth a lot was worth a lot more in those days, but it still wasn't a lot. It was the absolute minimum amount they could award. The FA Cup final was to be played on the 28th of April, and it was to be played in a new venue, when the new Wembley Stadium, or the new Empire Stadium, as they were, they were calling it. This is what the Times had to say. Assured of a place in the new ground from which to watch the play in comfort, the provincial enthusiast will be encouraged to come to London as in the old days when the match was decided at Crystal Palace. Which is an interesting way of putting it. I mean, how's about the um, 
the London enthusiast. Why, why isn't he going to the provinces? Anyway, it is built. It goes on. It is an unfortunate fact that this match seldom realises his expectations. Even when the two teams have been thought to be the best of the season, they have produced a display in which the science of the game has been crowded out by the greed for victory. Then as now. Also, uh, notice the interesting use of the word science. Last week I mentioned that there were ructions in Oxford because uh, a Mr Fagan wanted to open a, a theatre and a Mr Fennell... Farnell, Crozier, Farnell. The Vice-Chancellor of Oxford University didn't want him to open a theatre and had the power to prevent him. Anyway, this week comes the news that Mr Fennell has backed down. He utterly denies that his boss, the Chancellor, one Lord Curzon, of more later, has, um, has put pressure on him to do so. Also from a few weeks ago, actually the 1st of April episode, I, I mentioned that not hardly a week went by without a case of uh, someone, a motorist, being convicted for drunkenness. And of course, now it's three weeks has gone by, but we do have now we do now have an example. This is from Friday, the twenty seventh of April, at Bow Street Police Court yesterday. George Modebadge, described as a music hall performer of Store Street W C, was fined five pounds and three pounds three shillings costs by Mr. Graham Campbell for being drunk while in charge of a motor car and driving to the danger of the public on the early morning of April the eighteenth. How they do is how they d establish drunkenness, I do not know. And finally, what will the well-dressed woman be wearing on her feet this year? That's right. Python skin shoes. Success has many fathers, but failure is an orphan. In a speech on Saturday, Neville Chamberlain made some remarks about his time as Postmaster General, in which the BBC, the British Broadcasting Company, was established. This is from Monday the 23rd of April. He felt bound to notice another incident which had some personal connection with himself. His immediate predecessor as Postmaster General, Mr Kellaway, who is now a director of the Marconi Company, no conflict of interest there, which was one of the leading members of the British Broadcasting Company, apparently thinking that the agreement between the Post Office and the Broadcasting Company was going to come in for some criticism, had been writing to the Times to disclaim responsibility for that agreement and to say that it was made by him, Mr Chamberlain, three months after Mr Kellaway had left office. It is quite true, said Mr Chamberlain, that I did sign that agreement last January, but it was an agreement already printed and ready for signature when I signed it, and I did not alter a word of it. If the man who actually negotiated the terms of the agreement with a British broadcasting company, who went to the House of Commons and got their approval to the general outlines of that agreement, is going to pretend that the agreement is mine and not his, I say that he is trying to shelter himself behind a transparent quibble, and I am very much surprised that anybody who has held the sort of position that Mr Kellaway has held should stoop to such paltry expedients. Mr Kellaway was not one to take this lying down. This is his reply from Tuesday the 24th. In his reply to my letter in which I pointed out that the broadcasting agreement was made by him three months after I left office, Mr Chamberlain admits the complete accuracy of my statement. He says, however, that the responsibility for his signature is mine. This involves the most startling evasion of official responsibility which modern political practice has produced. What does Mr. Chamberlain mean? He cannot mean that although he signed the agreement, he did not approve of what he was signing, or that he did not know what he was signing. Neither explanation is possible in the case of one who is not only a responsible minister of the Crown, but a man with a business training. For what it's worth, I think Kellaway is being devious here. He is trying to claim that it's not a good deal, but it's the one he negotiated and was perfectly happy with. That makes no sense. Um, having said that, uh, it's perhaps worth pointing out that this will not be the last agreement that Neville Chamberlain will regret signing. On Monday, Lord Curzon made a speech. It was interesting for a couple of things. The first thing is that he was, he said that there's nothing wrong with uh, the Prime Minister. He's not really unwell. He will recover and everything will be fine. Uh, how many times have you heard that one before? 
And the other thing he said was that it would be a good idea if uh, members of the House of Lords were able to address the House of Commons and vice versa. Uh, the obvious implication being that uh, wouldn't that be jolly useful if you know he would become prime minister at some point. It, it ought to be said he did in the speech say that this was a long-standing view of his uh, and indeed he introduced a bill apparently. Well, that's true or not, I don't know. On Thursday there was, I was going to say debate, uh, a discussion in the uh, House of Commons about uh, uh, Winston Churchill's new book. It's called The, the World Crisis, in case you, you didn't know. Um, because, and this, this is something that frequently comes up, is people are not happy or they suspect he's been given access to secret documents which he has no, no right to or no longer has a right to see, seeing he's no longer the, the guy in charge of the Navy. And I think there's a certain amount of envy going on as well. Uh, if you want a copy of The World Crisis and you happen to live in 1923, it'll cost you 30 shillings, which is uh, three-tenths of an ounce of gold. And um, according to my calculations and applying the Crozier, Crozier fudge factor, uh, comes to some uh, 240 pounds. That's just for one volume. This will go to five. So, well, obviously some people... Well, this is a bestseller, by the way which amazes me anyway. He's doing very well. But in this discussion, I saw this. Lord Curzon. Is the right honourable gentleman aware that Mr Churchill's book contains the gravest possible inaccuracies in its relations to one of the most gallant officers of the Navy? Now, hang about. Hang about. Lord Curzon is saying that. Well, first of all, it's a very odd thing for Lord Curzon to say, because he's a foreign secretary. And secondly, hang about. Isn't Lord Cod Curzon in the Lords? Now, he might not be. You occasionally do hear, see in, in Hansard someone called a Lord. Now, what's going on? I, I saw this many, many years ago when I saw a debate in the House of Commons involving a Lord James Douglas Hamilton. And I was perplexed by this, and someone had to explain to me that it's what's known as a courtesy title. If you're from a, a well-established landed gentry family then there's a good chance, as well as the, the formal title that, you're, that you have, you may have a few others that you've stacked up. I mean, for instance, the Prince of Wales is also the Duke of Cornwall. So maybe that's what's going on. But this is not possible. I mean, the Lord Curzon is very much a member of the House of Lords. And so I thought, well, what's going on here? Well, it turns out, and oh yes, we know he can't address the House of Commons because he said so. So what's going on here? Well, the answer is there are two Lord Curzons. I mean, I have never knowingly in my life met anyone called Curzon. And here are two of them, and they're both Lords. We have George Nathaniel Curzon, first Marquis Curzon of Kettleston and Foreign Secretary. And Francis Richard Henry Penn Curzon, 5th Earl Howe, or will be 5th Earl Howe, um, who's using the courtesy title of Viscount Curzon, who is the current Member of Parliament for Battersea South, and by the way, will be a future winner of Le Mans. Well, I thought that was a bit weird. Anyway, last week I, I did briefly mention the, the troubles with the, with the mark and the hyperinflation in Germany, and, and, and stated that uh, I hadn't seen any articles which uh, talked about what it was like living under conditions of hyperinflation. Anyway... As if they'd heard my call, this week the Times has one. This is from Monday the 23rd. The effect of the fall of the mark was at once apparent in the retail shops yesterday when a buyer's panic set in. The general public had been advised through the press not to make more than necessary purchases as a further rise could only ensue. Nevertheless, there was a rush of buyers for all classes of goods with the expected result of a considerable rise in prices. Ah, good old panic buy, eh? Now, you'd have thought this was evidence enough that uh, you should link your currency to gold. But some would disagree. This is from a Mr H.K. Gordon, and this is from Friday the 27th. The Bank Act of 1844, which determined our gold standard currency system, failed several times, and the Bank of England had to suspend a payment of gold. 
On each occasion, the mere promise of extended note issues, especially of small denominations, at once averted panic. Again in 1914, gold was withdrawn and paper saved the situation. Our paper currency has triumphantly carried us through the greatest crises in history. Were gold to be introduced, its withdrawal would assuredly be repeated on the outbreak of another war. Why not let well alone? Where does one start? To make sense of that, uh, or to be able to criticise that letter properly, you, you, you have to have a, a good understanding of the history of money, I, I, I would suggest. And there isn't the time here to do that. Uh, I will say, though, luckily there is a, an excellent YouTube series by Professor Bath, which is out there. I will put a link in the description to it. Well, I hope I will put a link into the description anyway. Um, and that would be an excellent introduction if you are interested in, the, in this question. Uh, when he comes to talk about the suspension of payment, I, well, I'll, I'll, I'll back up a bit. For a long, long time, it was possible to go along to the Bank of England with a Bank of England note, hand it in at, to a cashier and receive gold uh, in exchange. And that was possible up until 1914 and the outbreak of the First World War. And that gold window, as it's known, has not been reintroduced. Now, oh goodness, what was that? <laughs> what was the point I was trying to make? Anyway, that's the sort of basic point that's being made here. And and, and since then, uh, all you have is a, is a paper note which can only be exchanged for another paper note. So, so he's saying, well, why go back to it? Well, you'd hope by now we, you'd, you could see the reason. Because between 18, the end of the Napoleonic Wars and the outbreak of the First World War, there was no inflation in Britain. Prices may have, you know, individual prices may have gone up or gone down, but overall they, they stayed the same, or almost none anyway. And you also had the gold standard, and you had a huge expansion in prosperity. Since 1923, the pound has lost something like 99.5% of its value, which is why I'm constantly making these conversions from the pound then to the pound now, or as best as I can. We have also had multiple crashes in my lifetime. That's been 1974, 1987, 2000, 2008... Um, well, we're slightly overdue for one. I suppose there was a slight one in 2020, but that was sort of COVID-related. We also have, have had much inflation, as we are lots of inflation, as we are suffering from right now. Well, Mr. All I can say is, Mr. Gordon, I hope you're happy. There has been a general election in Bulgaria, and the Times felt it worthy to mark this with an editorial. This is from Wednesday, the 25th of April. The general election in Bulgaria has brought a sweeping victory to Musha Stambuliski. I wonder why they put M for every foreigner. They're not all French, you know. Anyway, he goes on. Her actual Prime Minister, and the most commanding political figure in the Balkans today. His followers, the Agrarians, have carried 205 seats out of 246. Oh yeah, that's over 80%. His success is even greater than was anticipated. The peasants, a sturdy race of small proprietors, have long regarded him as their champion, but he found unexpectedly large support in the towns. His opponents ascribe their defeat to terrorism, as an odd way of putting it, an explanation which in Balkan politics cannot infrequently be substantiated. Is that a fact? In any case, a new lease of power has been accorded to a resolute, masterful leader. Bismarckian in build and in method, whose future career is likely to be a matter of great importance both to the Balkans and to Western Europe. Or maybe not. Anyway, that's all for this week. I aim to have something up next week, but I promise nothing. <laughs>